Hey everyone, Bruce Eckfeld here. Thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Make sure that you subscribe and turn on notifications so we can let you know when the next video is posted. You can also check us out at Eckfeld.com for more great content. With that, let's go check out the video. You're listening to Scaling Up Services, where we speak with entrepreneurs, authors, business experts, and thought leaders to give you the knowledge and insights you need to scale your service-based business faster and easier. And now, here is your host, business coach, Bruce Eckfeld. Welcome, everyone. This is Scaling Up Services. I'm Bruce Eckfeld. I'm your host. And our guest today is Andy Goal. And Andy is the creator of the urgency-based selling system. And I'm excited about this because selling is huge for service-based companies. So I'm looking forward to, to getting into this topic and having this conversation. Andy, welcome to the program. Thank you for inviting me. So I always like to start with guests giving a little bit about their background. So how did you get into what you're doing today? What were you doing uh, previously professionally? And, and give us a little bit of the story. Well, great. Sure, sure. So I, uh, I had my last job where I worked for somebody in 1984. <laughs> and I was uh, a pricing and planning. I did pricing and planning for a company, a container company. Uh -huh. And it turned out that they had a, a unique item that didn't fit in with the rest of the industrial mix, like uh, coffee cans, paint cans. It was a decorative tin. So I had the assignment of selling marketing it. it was, the company was based in New Jersey. When they, when they moved to Atlanta, they offered me a job, but I, I didn't want to move to Atlanta. And I suggested that I go uh, full time. Instead of doing pricing and planning and some selling, I, I, I wanted to go full time as an independent sales agent. So yeah. they set me up in a sales agency in 1984. And I started selling uh, these containers, these decorative tins on a commission business. And I did that for 10 years. Along the way, I, I developed a consumer product okay. uh, packed in a tin, which I sold to most retailers including ultimately a uh, 55 truckload order to Walmart. <laughs> the famous Walmart order. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was insane. Yeah. But in 1993, I had hired a new accounting firm because my previous accounting firm, a service business, wasn't uh, giving me enough new ideas. So I hired a new accounting firm. They invited me in for a meeting to try to sell me a proprietary spreadsheet they had developed in the years before the graphical interface when we still worked oh, at, the, at the DOS prop line. Yeah. And I listened to a one hour presentation. Afterwards, I asked the name partner in the firm, is this how you guys normally sell? <laughs> and he it. said, yeah, it was pretty good, wasn't it? And I said, gee, I thought it needed work. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I went home, I thought about it for a week or two, and I called this guy back, his name was Bert, and I said, Bert, you and your six partners in your CPA firm you need to hire me to teach you how to sell. Yeah. And um, and you folks probably know that, you know, CPAs tend to be pretty conservative, but I was a I was a client of the firm. They kind of yeah. like some of my theory. So they invited me in for a meeting, and this is how the meeting went in short form. Uh -huh. So Andy, have you ever trained the CPA firm before? No. <laughs> Do you have any testimonial letters to show success you've had in training any of your clients? No. Have you ever trained anybody at any time anywhere? No. no. <laughs> Do you have some curriculum you could show us to give us an idea of what you would teach us if you hired us? No. Then what the hell makes you think you could, you could train us? I said, it's very simple. I listened to your presentation, and it could be a lot better. So they didn't know what to do with me. They were interested in my ideas. One day, they brought me out on a sales call. My instructions from the, the two named partners was to, were to be silent, to observe. Yeah. And then after the meeting, they would debrief. Maybe I could give them some specific ideas. For the first hour of the sales meeting where they were trying to close a manufacturer on the accounting, did about $30 million in sales, this manufacturer. For the first hour, I followed my instruction. And then after it, I couldn't take it anymore. So I raised my hand. The CPAs melted. Uh -oh. The owner of the firm said, uh, "What are your, you know, what's your? Yeah. Uh, how can I help you? You've been <laughs> yeah. quiet for an hour." Yeah, exactly. I asked two questions and I closed the sale. Yeah. And about a month later, they hired me, and that's how I got into this business. For the six months I worked with the CPA firm, their closing ratio went from about twenty-five percent to eighty percent. And so what was the change? How did you change what they sold, how they sold it? Well, I, I, I had been developing this method, which I now call urgency-based selling. And I, I taught them elements of it. I taught them how to ask better questions. I taught yeah. them how to ask for commitment. 
Yeah. You know, th think about this. Uh, I started a business by asking two questions. That's how I started this business. Yeah, that's you know? great. So that's a um, to me that's that's a pretty interesting sidebar to this story. Well, I, I like it. It's it's what I call the sales jujitsu, right? It's where you you someone comes in thinking they're going to sell you, and you end up selling them. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And it happens more often than you think. That's great. So let's talk a little bit about urgency based selling because you know clearly you know you've been you know, in, in this field for a while, you've been selling, you know, lots of different things, you know, decorative tins to CPA services. Why this focus on, on urgency? Like, what is it about urgency? What When you talk about urgency, what do you mean? And why does it end up being so effective for you? It came, thank you. For, it came from a, a fundamental uh, distinction that I noticed early on between two words, interest and urgency, interest and urgency. So interest is the province of marketing. So when somebody says they're interested, that can be like a lead, right? Urgency is the province of selling. Urgency means I have a compelling need to act now. So rule of thumb, you will never close uh, interest, like in zero out of 100 cases, never. You will never close interest. So one of two things have to happen. Either the prospect has urgency, in other words, a compelling need to act now, or, and this is where a salesperson often makes his or her bones, you have to you have to grow interest into urgency. You have to take somebody who says, I'm interested, tell me more, and you have to help develop that into urgency. So we can only close urgency, we can never close interest, and that's really the basis or the fundamental idea. It's interesting. I think it's a really powerful kind of distinction because I think you, you know, salespeople or people in sales situations, I mean, even if you're not officially a salesperson, if you're in a selling situation as a business owner, as an executive, um, it can often be this false sense of security to get this kind of feeling or feedback from a prospect, uh, from a lead that they're interested in it. You know, and, and I run into this a lot. You know? They're like, oh, yeah, they were really interested. I'm like, OK, but are they going to sign the deal? <laughs> and I think that I haven't quite thought of it that way, but I think that's it. I think it's about are they in a situation where they they are going to suffer some kind of consequence, pain, you know, fear of missing out if they don't take action. And if we can't find that, yeah, I think the probabilities are, are, are extremely low. I mean, you know, unless you're talking about, you know, a trivial purchase of some sorts where they're fine just making it, maybe they'll need it later. So, so how, um, I, I guess, how do you, how do you know, like when you, when you're speaking with a prospect and you're speaking with a lead, how, how do you really dig into this issue of, are, are they just interested or is there really urgency behind, behind their situation? Like, how do you know? Well, that's a great question. That's the qualifying question. Yeah. When you ask that question of a salesperson, he or she will usually say, I know it's chemistry or I know it by the, the way they ask questions. But the problem with that is that you could fall prey to the buyer scam. The buyer scam is where the buyer just needs a price, yeah. either to show his or her boss that they've been shopping well or to beat up the incumbent. And if a buyer running the scam is only scamming you, they're not going to say, would you mind, Bruce, Bruce, would you mind spending 10 hours working on a proposal so I could take your proposal to beat the living hell out of the incumbent? That's not going to motivate you. Yeah. So they run the scam, and this is how the scam goes. Say, Bruce, I know you've been trying to get my business for the last 10 years, and it must have been frustrating, but Joe's my guy. Joe always takes care of me. Yeah. But, you know, in the last six months, something seems to have gone wrong. Joe doesn't return his phone calls in a timely way. There are unexplained charges on the invoices. And, and the service and quality isn't what it used to be. I think something's gone in that relationship. And Bruce, I've heard great things about you in the marketplace. Can I encourage you to come in and, and quote me and you know prepare a proposal? Yeah. And, and that sounds good to you, Bruce, doesn't it? The second, the second script sounds a lot better than you're never going to get a stick of business. Yeah, exactly. So you come in, you do the work, and then I take your proposal and I beat the living hell out of Joe, and that's the buyer scam. Yeah. So when you ask this question about interest and urgency, it has deep implications for resource allocation, for our emotions, how motivated we are. And, and the answer that you know, we recommend is the PIK approach, the payment in kind approach. So the basic idea here is that if you don't have a one call close, which means you walk in and you can walk out with a purchase order, it's, it's a process. And most of us have a process. Yeah. 
And the question is, is that process moving forward as measured by the behaviors done by the prospect? So what are some examples? Well, if you're going to give them credit, they might fill out a credit application. If you're not dealing with the owner of the business and he or she is so excited about what you have to say, they might introduce you to the owner. They might take you on a planned tour if that's relevant. Checking references is huge. If they check your references, that's usually a very strong tell. These different behaviors are manifestations that the prospect is engaged, that they're not a spectator, but it's a participant sport. And the stronger the PIK, the more likely it is that you're going to close. And the rule of thumb is you always ask for the strongest PIK to which you've earned the right. Yeah. And so the reason why you need a powerful presentation, why you need to wow the prospect and prove your case is so you can earn the right to a strong PIK and expect the prospect reasonably to do it. I like so this. my advice yeah. to all listeners is watch the PIKs, the payments in kind. And it's interesting because I think um, just having worked with a lot of organizations on kind of s sales strategy, sales process, and and you know kind of the sales funnel design or the typically the sales journey. What does that journey look like? You know, we'll look for these points where you know there's some kind of investment, you know, of time or money on the client's behalf and in, into the process. Um, you know, which just sounds like kind of like this, this idea of they've they're spending some kind of time or energy or money on this relationship. And I think you, I think the test, it, it sounds like this, that the, the, the buyer's game uh, or the kind of the buyer fallacy <laughs> scenario that you presented, I think I like the idea that the way you check to see whether or not you're in that situation is you look for some kind of commensurate investment on the client. And if they're not, if they're really not willing, able, or they, just, they don't make a reasonable investment into the process, then it's kind of a tell that you're you're probably in one of these scenarios because they're they're just not they're not putting time and money into it. Agreed. And and if I could add one thing, this is a point where selling intersects the game Texas Hold'em. Oh, explain more. And there's an intersection between selling and Texas Hold'em. In the in the card game Texas Hold'em, uh -huh. if there's some of your listeners not familiar, the climactic moment of the game is when you go all in and you push all your chips in the pot. It's a poker game, right? Yeah. And, and there's a place to do that in selling. So there's an intersection point between the PIK and totally committed. So a quick story. There was a time about 15 years ago where I really needed to close the sale. It took me a year to get the first meeting. In the first meeting, company did about 50 million in sales. They had about five divisions. I was cross-examined by the division heads and the entrepreneur who owned them. They were on one side, owned the companies. Uh -huh. They were on one side of the table. I was on the other side of the table. Three-hour cross-examination. Invited back the next day for the, by the president of the division where I would work if I was hired. Another three-hour cross-examination. That night, I get an email from the, the owner, the entrepreneur who owned all the businesses saying, hey, Andy, we really like what you had to say. Would you give us a proposal you know, for the division where you would work? And my belly told me that this was a price shopper. Yeah. And if I said a buck, he would say 50 cents. Yeah. And I felt that he had to get to know me better than he just liked me belly to belly. So I said, I'll be glad to propose to you, but could I ask you first to check my references, check three or four references, and I gave him 10 references. Uh -huh. I get an email back in a few minutes. Andy, after I get your proposal, if I'm still interested, I'll check. I'll be glad to check your references. Now, what would your listeners do if they were playing that hand? You have a mortgage to pay. You have a car payment. You uh -huh. need it badly. And all they're saying is, would you just give me a price? Yeah. Right? So I wrote back to him, to the owner. I said, listen, I got it. You don't have a sense of urgency for what I'm selling. Here's why it's so important to check my references. You need to know, am I creative? Do I play nicely in the sandbox? What's my work ethic like? Yeah. And you can't find that out from interviewing me twice for three hours or from the proposal. If at some point in the future, you have a sense of urgency for what I offer, check my references and I'll give you a proposal. Now, I want you to know, I've done this maybe three dozen times in my life. I die every time I do it. Every <laughs> single time. I, I just see my life, but my because my emotions are screaming at me. What are you I crazy? Know. Do what they say, but my brain is telling me if I do what they say, I lose. So I yield to the brain. Yeah. And as you can imagine, in this case, within 15 minutes, he was checking my references. How did okay. I know? Because people called me and said, Hey, Joe just called yeah. and gave you a clean bill of health. Yeah. So what? I it's like not that. only having PIKs, it's how do you use them? Yeah, it's interesting. So I use 
I use something, it's a little similar, and actually I call it the test fold. So it's a similar kind of uh, poker analogy, where when something goes a little cold, when a prospect goes a little cold, and anyone who's listening to this podcast who's been a prospect of mine has, has seen me do this, where if things get a little cold, I'll, I'll send them an email, or I'll leave them a message just saying, hey, you know, just checking in. I get the sense that maybe now's not, not the time to do this. Totally fine with me. I'm happy to, you know, put this on the shelf or pick it back up later. Just give me a date, you know, just get back to me so I can update my records, right? So it's kind of this test fold, right? I'm saying, look, I'm fine if we're going to fold this hand, you know, totally cool, no pressure. And the and it is, it's that same kind of, you know, I've got to swallow yeah. hard before I send that email because sure. <laughs> it's, not, it's not what I want to do. But but what it does is it, it it's that test of saying, hey, look, are they really serious? And either... Either I get the message back that says, oh, no, 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 I was on vacation last week. You know, let's call, let's set up a call tomorrow or they'll pick up the phone and call me right then. Or I will get the email that says, yeah, you know what? I, we just realized that now's not the time and why don't we circle back in three months? And both of those are great answers <laughs> you know, because if Absolutely. they're really not interested, like, you know, I should be focusing on other things. I, you know, go call on another prospect. You know, I should write some more content. Like, like I shouldn't be investing my time and energy if they're not really ready. It's a great point. And, you know, there are, there are three key takeaways that I would just summarize from the discussion. Number one, PIKs will tell you the difference between interest and urgency. Number two, you have to earn the right with a powerful presentation. If you're not wowing the prospect, don't expect to earn the right. That's a key phrase, earn the right to the PIK. Yeah. And number three, if you're facing a real buyer, you should expect them you know, to push you and shove you and so you have to be ready to go all in and be totally committed. Yeah. Those are the three or four key ideas. Yeah. Let's go back and talk a little bit about the earn the right, because I don't, I'm not sure we, we really dug into that quite enough. So, uh, you, so you mentioned the idea of a, a powerful presentation. Like what, what, I guess, in essence, what is what earns the right and what are some of the things you do in the sales conversation, the sales process that earns the right to, to ask for their commitment or ask for action on their side? Give us some examples. Sure. Well, I do sales training, and uh, recently I just closed a car dealership where there were 30 people who needed to be trained. And it was a one-call close, which is pretty infrequent in my business. And it was in the diagnosis when I was asking questions and saying, gee, I really don't know your business, but I've had 100 clients over the last 25 years. You know, average increase in sales is 10 to 20%. And here are some of the challenges that I frequently hear. And I started going through them. And you could just see that either from, you know, visual tells or ahas, or I hit on all the cylinders because the problems tend to be universal. And after I had done this for about a half hour or 45 minutes, the prospect really opened up. And before you knew it, we were, we were designing the first step of the program. So the first thing you could do is just a fantastic diagnosis to show that you're authentic, incredible, and you know the space. Yeah, I think, I, I think that's, uh, I mean, we I always talk about be, being the doctor, you know, going yes. in with this kind of, well, you know, where does it hurt and how long has it been hurting? And, you know, does it change with the weather? And you, know, you just start asking them these kind of curiosity diagnosis questions to help them. And, and sometimes they haven't even thought about these things. They're like, oh, yeah, I hadn't, I hadn't thought about that. It always happens in, you know, the beginning of the year. Absolutely. I wonder why that is. And I would just add the thought at the same time, I don't ask them if they have the problem. I talk about about problems other people have. Ooh, and then I might I might segue to them and say, gee, is that ever an issue here? Yeah, that's so funny. I, I, think I, I think I do that too. I'll, I'll use the phrase a lot of, you know, well, other CEOs that I work with, I'll often have, you know, this problem or often find this a, a challenge. Is this something that you find a challenge? Exactly. Yeah. Now, before that, I omitted something, excuse me. Yeah, go ahead. The research we do before we come in is really important. Yeah. The research we do. So there's a whole bunch of things you could do and I'll just I'll just mention one or two in case yeah. they might be of interest to your audience. There's a um, there's a utility that costs nineteen dollars a month called Crystal Nose, C R Y S T A L K N O W S dot com. Yeah. And what it does is it, it it's an algorithm that scrapes all the writings on somebody on an on the internet, Facebook, LinkedIn, and does a disk style analysis. And so you could have a pretty decent insight into a person's personality before you have a first call. Yeah. So that's a good thing to do. Another th good thing to do, particularly if you're selling uh, to smaller to mid-sized companies that aren't covered by the national press. Okay. If you, everybody I recommend should be doing library research. You go into the into your local library, your public library, 
You go once, you go to the reference librarian, and you get set up, usually with your library code as your username, and then you get put in a password. And then from any computer connected to the internet, you can get into your library's database. Yeah. And within 15 minutes, you can usually get a very powerful research presentation together, including using a special database called America's News. America's News is a compendium of, I think, 400 regional newspapers. So if you're dealing with a a smaller company that wouldn't be covered in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, USA Today, America's News may cover them. Like uh, I live in Chatham, so it could be the Chatham Gazette. And you could get great articles. And the other thing you get that's really neat if you're dealing with a bigger company, if you if you have a library like mine, yeah. what you could get are SWOT analyses from uh, MarketLine. MarketLine is a company that will sell these things for about $175, and many of us won't spend that. But if you can get a SWOT analysis on a bigger company that's covered for free, you should get it. And as a matter of fact, I would argue it's a hanging offense if you don't do this research because <laughs> it's all free. I know. So, so getting back to the question, how do you have a powerful presentation? By dropping a few tidbits to show that you've done your research. Yeah. And let me give you a third one, because these are all freebies. These are things you can do immediately. The Wayback Machine is really neat. The Wayback Machine yeah. is really neat. <laughs> so what the Wayback Machine does is it, it's captured whole, uh, websites yeah. going back, in many cases, 20 years. And so what you do is you use the Wayback Machine, you look up how the way, how the website looked 20 years ago, how it looks today, you print them out. And you could do this as part of your marketing. You could do this uh, when you when, just when you come in, you say, wow, look at how your website looked 20 years ago. Look how your website looks now. You really care about your image. I have to think you care as much about the quality of your product, how fast you deliver, yeah. you know, you're selling, your Im- whatever it is that you sell. So the Wayback Machine is a fantastic way to start a sales call or to try to solicit uh, a meeting, just yeah. to get a meeting. So you have research. Fantastic diagnostic questions, and then there's the vision. Remember our discussion being here, how do you wow somebody? Yeah. Right? So so the vision, you know, you talked about the pain. I like to think that the pain is a small piece, and the bigger piece can be the vision of what's possible. Uh And I use the metaphor of the false summit, the false summit. I actually have an illustration of a a successful person standing on a summit. But it's if you know your calculus, it's a local maximum versus a global maximum. Yeah. And then I say to the prospect, look, a lot of our clients are doing really well, or they couldn't even, you know, speak to me. I wouldn't come in. You know, they couldn't afford my fees, and they think they're doing really well. But the problem is they're looking down instead of looking up, and they're on a false summit. And the reason why I'm calling you is just to explore: could you be on a false summit or a false peak? Yeah. And I have a little animation that goes with that when I do a presentation. Now, how do you bring somebody from a, a full summit to a global maximum or, or, or a true summit? And the answer is type three knowledge, type three knowledge. So type one is what you know. Type two is what you know you don't know. And type three is what you don't realize you don't know. Yeah. And so folks who are effective sellers are usually very powerful in bringing in type three knowledge. Now, you can use both of these ideas, the false peak and type three knowledge, as a pattern interrupter when you're trying to get an appointment. So you get a prospect on the phone, you've dialed a hundred times, you finally get them on the phone, they've picked up the phone by accident, they thought it was their <laughs> wife or husband, you know, and, and and they say, well, what do you want and why are you calling? You say, gee, Bruce, I'm calling here today to see, you know, if, if, if you're on a false peak as many of our clients are and whether our type three knowledge might be able to help you. Now you, Bruce, have two possible responses at that point. One is to hang up on me, but the other is to ask a question, like, what's this false peak or what's type three knowledge? Yeah. And now you're in a conversation. Yeah. So depending on where you are in your process, having pattern interrupters ready that are powerful can be very helpful. Yeah. So if you present the vision of what's possible, now you need what we call a wow toolbox, a toolbox that's stock full of incredible proving material testimonials, written testimonials, video testimonials. Oh, another important thing that goes into your WOW toolbox are risk mitigants. 
Risk mitigants means what do I do to reduce the perceived risk to the prospect? So the prospect doesn't want to change his or her position for a number of reasons, including perceived risk. Yeah. And I would have to say that in almost 100% of the people who invite me in to work with them, they have no real strong program to deal with risk aversion, no risk mitigants. Yeah, no, I think the interesting part about this is I, it's kind of this concept of you have to keep the sales conversation focused on where the buyer is at and and that you know you you can't be talking about risk mitigation if they're not thinking about risk mitigation yet like if they're still at the should I even bother listening to this person or not <laughs> you know like you need to stay you need to get past that level before you go on to the next level and i think a lot of a lot of challenges that i've seen or were kind of failures in sales process and sales you know sales conversations or particular prospects you know have been that either it's been rushed is that they try to move too quickly you know, and the buyer is not ready to to advance to the next stage, or or they're just at the wrong stage. They've, uh, you know, they haven't they haven't laid out their conversation strategy in a kind of logical, sequential way in, in which the buyer is going to go through it. And so it it sounds like a lot of this is look at the beginning. You have to have the pattern disruptor to kind of get their attention. You know, then you have to kind of prove that you're you're worth listening to. Then you yes. have to deal with their yes. objections. You know, it's like you're really kind of staging this about. Well, how how is the prospect's mind or prospect's thinking going to advance, and how do I keep pace with that and then move through that process? Agreed. In fact, I have developed as part of my proprietary deliverable what I call a standard sales call, which is an 18-step process to take a prospect's once you you know you're starting to disrupt their pattern of thought. How do you take them through a whole thought and decision process? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's that's the key. And it, I mean, I think there is generally some human psychology similarities between this. Some of this ends up being some, you know, kind of industry specific, uh, you know, based on the kind of machinations of a particular industry or, uh, you know, how a particular business works. Uh, you know, some of this is going to be individual. I love the crystal nose. Uh, we didn't talk about it. I, I'm a big fan of that. I've, I've tracked them for years. And that that whole idea of, look, you know, people are wired in different ways. And, you know, if you're approaching someone as a strong D and they happen to be, you know, an I, you know, in, in yes. this parlance, you, know, you, you, you are, are going to be in a world of pain. Yep, yep, 100%. So, so this idea of, of really kind of not only diagnosing the problem, but kind of diagnosing the person that you're dealing with and understand what kind of drove, drives and motivates them and their style and how do I match that, you know, from a, a conversation point of view is, is really important. So we're going to hit time here in a little bit. I, you know, we could probably do two or three more <laughs> episodes on a lot of these. I would say, uh, you know, you, you've got a lot of great content. So I'm going to encourage folks to uh, check out your your URLs and uh, you've got videos. Um, some I, I will just I'll I'll mention the whole idea of pre mortems. Uh, you do some really good stuff on that. I would suggest people check that out. You know, just kind of thinking through uh, before you go into a call, like what could go wrong and how do I prepare and how do I develop a strategy around those things. Great, uh, you know, just great. Uh, Great ideas and, and, and great strategies on these things. So, um, if people want to find out more about you, about uh, urgency-based selling, and I know if you got a book coming out, tell us about the book, and then give us some of the URLs and stuff uh, for sure. people to Thank get more you. information. Thank yeah. you for that opportunity. Yeah. Um, the book is called "Innovate Now: uh, Scale Up with 16 Breakthrough uh, Selling Techniques," and it's an attempt to give the reader two things fish they can eat today, in other words, immediate techniques they could use, like the PIK technique that I described is in there, yep. but also uh, different thought processes. You mentioned the pre-mortem. That's a way to generate your own ideas, or to put it metaphorically, it's a way to fish yourself. Yeah. And I also include in there an induction worksheet that I pulled out of Francis uh, uh, Bacon's New Organon, which was written in so I have a, a brainstorming technique that I use, and that's in the book. Oh, cool. And so the, the whole thrust of the book is, is how can you innovate now? What, what are techniques you can use? It's kind of written like the one-minute manager where the chapters are very short, like five, six pages. Yeah. But there's usually a high-level concept like the PIK. So that's what the book is. And it's supposed to – the publisher promises me it'll be out in May. <laughs> We'll see if that happens. We will uh, see. The, the easiest way to look, I have a YouTube channel for urgency-based selling, and mm -hmm. the website is urgencybasedselling.net. 
And so I'd love to hear from people. My my email address is Andy at Andy at urgencybaseselling.net. So uh, those are ways to connect and to learn more. So thank you for this opportunity. Yeah, you're welcome. I'll make sure that all of those links uh, are in the show notes here so people can click through and get those. Andy, this has been a pleasure. Like I said, we could probably we could do this for a couple of hours. So we'll set up another one at some point. We can dig into some of these topics. Uh, this was a lot of fun. I learned a lot. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity. I'm very grateful to you. And thanks to your audience. You've been listening to Scaling Up Services with business coach Bruce Eckfeldt. To find a full list of podcast episodes, download the tools and worksheets, and access other great content, visit the website at scalingupservices.com. And don't forget to sign up for the free newsletter at scalingupservices.com slash newsletter. 